We'd like to call up to the stage Frank Brown, hereditary chief, Hiltzuk First Nation, and ex officio of the Joint Working Group, and Keith Christmas, Guardian Program Liaison Coordinator, Unamaki Institute of Natural Resources, and member of the JWG. If I could have Keith Christmas and Frank Brown. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Keith Christmas, and uh, I am the uh, Onamagi uh, Garden Liaison Coordinator in um, uh, Onamagi, Cape Breton. I'm from uh, the uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, First Nation of Member Two, and uh, our uh, our territory that uh, that we uh, serve on our organization is Onamagi, Cape Breton, and uh, that's where. I come from, and uh, the organization that uh, that we serve is the uh, the five Aboriginal communities that uh, that are surrounding the uh, Bador Lakes. Um, the uh, the okay there okay. Um, one of the things that uh, we've done as as a joint working group, we worked on a number of things, but one of the uh, very important aspects of, uh, of Guardian programming is uh, training and uh, education, which is a very, very important component of, of Guardian programming. And um, um, where's this? Uh, yeah. So what we've uh, compiled is a, um, uh, a discussion paper that uh, we feel is is could a could be a good guide towards uh, some ideas on uh, on what we think should be a a good uh, uh, guide to uh, um, uh, use towards uh, uh, towards a, a better in our training um, of course uh, the 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 central theme that we've been hearing uh, so much uh, today and 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 and, uh, and and many times is our love of, of the land and the water and how important it is to us, is to us and, it, and how sacred it is. And it is our responsibility to look after that care and protect it. And this is one of the central uh, roles, focuses of guardians. Um, we currently uh, estimate, have, have, have over uh, 40 guardian programs in place. Uh, I do believe there is uh, some sort of a, a database in, uh, around that that, do, that does track that, and um, and uh, each of these uh, um, uh, um, programs do ha do have training either uh, either in our community or in in collaboration with other communities, and I know that uh, with our with our. Uh, territory, uh, we have uh, uh, five Aboriginal communities where we do uh, uh, collaborate together uh, in training, things like that. Um, the role of the uh, the network, National Network for Guardian Training, uh, I think is very important. This is an important aspect to uh, provide support to these guardian programs and to facilitate uh, connections, connections that we would not normally see. And uh, if we didn't have a network, uh, a lot of these guardian programs out there, um, we may not know where to go for, for, uh, for, for training and for uh, 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 resourcing. So uh, the, the, um, these, uh, uh, the role of the network um, um, can can uh, um, uh, highlight some of the uh, uh, lessons learned from all of these guardian programs out there that would be able to uh, provide some good guidance on, on leading forward to, our, to establishing more pro our programs. And um, it would um, 
basically uh, uh, support uh, quality programming. Uh, this this uh, a national network uh, would would look at uh, options and different training options, and uh, would uh, I'm sure it would it would uh, uh, um, select and be able to uh, recommend uh, which which pro uh, training programs are very good. Um, it's uh, consensus about uh, about uh, existing programs. I think one of the things that uh, that I think is would be really is really common is to ensure the the connection of traditional knowledge and in in relation with also with Western knowledge. I think that's a very key uh, component that. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, training, and uh, uh, one of the areas that uh, that we could look at, and there may be other areas of con consensus, but that could be at least one of them that uh, we could be um, focusing on. And there, there, there may be others. And uh, and again, uh, this is uh, a d d d discussion paper that we have uh, compiled. Um, the network uh, uh, benefit uh, can benefit the Guardian programs, uh, uh, demonstrate the, the value for a program. Uh, why do we need Guardian programs? Uh, we, we need these programs to, 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 to monitor what, what's out there and to make sure that our, our, our waters, our, our lands are, 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 are protected and are safe and, and uh, um, these uh, uh, networks uh, uh, could uh, be um, very good for us to uh, coordinate uh, training opportunities. Uh, a network uh, a very, could be very uh, uh, beneficial for uh, uh, sourcing e external funding opportunities, opportunities that uh, uh, we may not know about or a community may not know about where a network would be, would be there available to uh, be able to guide uh, communities uh, on external sources, and uh, and the network would would essentially work towards the broader recognition of guardian programs. Um, in in some cases, it's it's uh, we've had pro programs for quite some time. I know that uh, uh, on our east coast, we've had guardian programs since 1992. And I believe I've been here a gentleman saying that there was been guardian programs in, in the West Coast even be, even prior to that. So, uh, so it's uh, and um, it's uh, we do have some long established programs, and we have some that are just starting up and relatively new. And I think it's uh, I think it's uh, very important uh, that uh, we look towards uh, uh, broader recognition and the importance of Guardian programs. And that could definitely be the, 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 the benefits of a network to be able to uh, uh, push that along. Um, Sub-regional networks are uh, important in collaboration, especially in collaboration with training, uh, in collaboration with communities, um, be able to uh, be able to source expertise. We the, the sub networks would would know what's going on in 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 the areas. Um, would know the finer details of of uh, what a national network may not know about. Uh, a a sub network would be able to uh, um, uh, be able to uh, source uh, uh, tr traditional knowledge um, keepers, uh, Western knowledge. Uh, uh, um, um, training, good training, and uh, this could be also be a, a sense where um, we could build up the these uh, uh, sub networks to be uh, to achieve some sort of a level of expertise where they can actually do some of their training, uh, including training in, in Western knowledge. Um, The uh, national networks and uh, local guardian training uh, we could uh, 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 
basically uh, uh, collaboration between nations and uh, community. Um, basically, uh, learn from one another, uh, share materials and, 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 and training models. Um, this, is one, this is one area I think that uh, I've seen an example of this already today. That um, um, just a small example, uh, the, the um, technology of, of the coastal tracker which is a, a, a program that's used to uh, collect data and, and information, which is very, very important uh, when you're a guardian and um, extremely important. And uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to know, to see that, uh, that there is a, a program out there that has been used and tested and um, deemed to be quite good for its application, and uh, and knowing that uh, that um, I myself and there's been others I see that are having interest in this, so is this a small example of uh, of uh, of how um, uh, a, uh, a a network could work to be able to uh, exchange ideas and to exchange uh, uh, the, the ways we do and and. Uh, so, and of course the uh, network would uh, work towards uh, 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 national recognition. And of course, without a network, um, we would basically have uh, 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 training that would, be, that would be sporadic. And uh, basically the strongest communities would, would, would basically benefit, I think, and without uh, other, other communities not really uh, getting the benefit of the uh, um, information that's, that could be uh, flown and, uh, uh, and shared through a, a network. Um, basically, I think in, uh, the, uh, a, a national network would, um, would, would keep the leadership of the Guardian program in indigenous hands. And the Guardian network would basically be uh, a model, a, a, a model to lift each other up uh, as one. Uh, we we uh, tend to have one uh, uh, basic uh, uh, goal in mind is, is to protect it, our, our waters, our lands, resources, and a a a, a, a national network is a is, is a means of being able to. Uh, uh, help each other up and uh, lift each other up. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's one of the values of, of a national network. Um, right. Would you like to use this mic, please? So how is everybody doing? Awesome, it's been an awesome last couple of days. There we go. Uh, first of all, I want to do a shout out to Pavi, who uh, helped with, uh, who helped me. We co-wrote this uh, discussion guide. The uh, information is in your stick, in your package. You also have a hard copy of this, so I don't think um, you have to worry too much about the information overload that you're probably feeling right now. Uh, thank you very much for being attentive to the important work that we're doing. So um, with this uh, guardian initiative and looking at um, uh, how we move forward with training and development, we recognize that there were kind of communities of practice but also we recognized that there was uh, thematic networks such as mining or forestry or different areas where there's some common interests around how do, we continue, how do we work together under these themes. Just as a clarification, um, I come by my relationship to the Guardians program honestly. I work for my nation. Uh, I was the founding director of the Hilftoch Integrated Resource Management Department. 
And then I went to work for the Coastal First Nations as their director of land and marine stewardship, in which there was a, uh, a group of um, First Nations that signed a reconciliation a protocol agreement with the government of British Columbia in which there is a commitment to shared decision making and revenue and benefit sharing. And so a part of the shared decision making was how do we build the institutional capacity to get to shared decision making. And so we set up our integrated resource management office and then from there we set up the stewardship directors network and um, we, we reached out to Vancouver Island University who supported us over the last six years and have trained just about 90 guardians. I was involved in the initial pilot program and now it's basically got a life of its own. And so we have completed the proof of concept over that period of time. We contracted out the curriculum from Vancouver Island University uh, but we've incorporated our local knowledge and uh, traditional knowledge into this agreement. Lots of information here, lots. So uh, national level collaboration and potential training related opportunities and benefits. I think Keith uh, alluded to a, it a bit here. Uh, training collaborations between nations or communities either to learn from one another or to develop meaningful training programs together. So that's one of the benefits. I'm not going to read all of that, but uh, we talk about this national network. Currently, if we have over 40 programs across the country, then we have smaller uh, regional networks like ours across the, the central, north coast, and Haida Gwaii, and amongst the non Awakalis group, which are the uh, the Kwakwala speaking people, to contextualize it, that's a tribe of 15, I believe. And not all members of that tribe are a part of that network. But that's just to give you a West Coast example. And uh, we've got the subnational or regional networks. Um, some of the stuff that we've been doing is um, shared logistics, taking the uh, Lessons learned from the Rangers tracker and customizing it to coast tracker, uh, the coast tracker. And how I would characterize the guardians from my lived experience on a coast, I would suggest that the guardian program is on the flagship of indigenous stewardship. The guardian program is the flagship of indigenous stewardship. They're the ones that gather the information. You should have people that should be able to analyze that data and then support leadership to make informed decisions about pressing and critical issues affecting your indigenous nation. And that's part of the benefit of the regional initiatives. So how do we get there? How we get there is by building institutional capacity and training to realize that, but in the body of work that has been done, your work in the previous gatherings, you said, look, you know, our communities are across a spectrum of where we're at with regards to our capacity. So we heard you. We heard what you said. And so we designed the program to say we're going to take a tiered approach to development to support the communities where they're at in their developmental phase in the developmental process with regards to indigenous stewardship. Common to all of our programs, applied learning based on experiential hands-on learning takes place mostly in the communities and in the field. The training is usually provided by elders. We've contracted out, as I mentioned, universities, college professors, and specialized trainers depending on the bioregion. That's why it's so important to have customized programs. There is no cookie cutter approach to indigenous guardian training. It has to be designed according to the, the vision of the indigenous leadership, the indigenous communities, according to your priorities and the, the contractors just our service providers to support and should be listening to that. We know currently there's a movement afoot to look at 
national uh, fisheries guardians programs. For some of us, that's very important. To other groups, it's not as important. Other groups, it's, it's dealing with uh, endangered caribou. So it's really important to be responsive according to where the, the, uh, the communities are, are at. Uh, key aspects in developing the program, foundations in local and traditional knowledge. We heard that loud and clear, that this has to be based on the indigenous worldview. Education should be led by indigenous worldview supplemented by Western science. So this little schematic here sort of clarifies that. We have uh, on, on my left the indigenous knowledge piece and in the Western knowledge piece hard skills like wilderness first aid. In some cases it could be uh, outboard mechanic repairs or skidoos depending on, on where you're at in your particular bioregion. You know, these are, these are hard skills but the local knowledge can only come from within our communities because it's tied to our language, our relationship to place. So it has to be designed by you according to your priorities. And we heard that loud and clear, and this is our response back. But in, in doing that work around that tiered approach, which he said in our meeting in Ottawa, it also brought up more questions. And that's why instead of writing a attempting to write a definitive paper on indigenous training for guardians or we said no there's we should have a discussion guide because you need to drive this agenda and set the priorities there's a question about national accreditation you know the need for national accreditation so that uh, we could standardize it according to some of these key more technical aspects up here on the Western knowledge side so that we can build efficiencies and be more effective in how we roll out these models of indigenous guardian training. Um, one of the uh, key pieces of um, advice or a question was how do we build the institutional capacity with our leaders? Like myself, um, I applied for a position with my nation. They posted for a, a director for our integrated resource management office. I have a background in outdoor recreation management. So I, I applied, I threw my hat in and I, I got the position. And, and so one of the things I, in the conversation with my leadership, they had a big shopping list of the things that they wanted to do. That was their vision. And I said, yes, we can chase down these things, absolutely. But I'll tell you what, the uh, effectiveness of our deliverables will be laser thin. And I suggested to them that we establish strategic relationships through protocol agreements. And that's why we put a protocol agreement with uh, Vancouver Island University, who is top notch in, in delivering um, applied learning models. And we did the same thing with Simon Fraser University and their resource and environmental management faculty because they have a graduate program in doing that work so that we can support our young aspiring leaders to take on these roles. Because if we don't do that, we're going to be dependent on outsiders to come in and provide that expertise for us. There's some young people that have that potential, but they need support. And currently, we're having a conversation with SFU's resource and environmental management faculty. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Ann Solomon from, from the faculty who's joined us today to talk about can we create a program where it would be similar to, uh, like, you know how they got the executive MBA type programs for our people in economic development? Well, why couldn't we have an, an executive stewardship director's training program so that we can have our people be able to provide that strategic leadership? Not, you know, to be, you know, obviously part of the criteria is uh, being familiar with the traditional knowledge, but the budgets, the HR, all of the different issues that we face in community. This is a very critical position for uh, our communities. 
So um, this here is a uh, piece on the regional training example. You know that saying, uh, picture is worth a thousand words. What I want to do now is um, just get, share, a, it's a six minute video on a, uh, the non, non walkless Guardian training program. It's a stewardship uh, technicians training program by Vancouver Island University. They're working with our coastal First Nations and also the, the non walkless group down on Vancouver Island. So that's a, a bit of an example. And like we said, 90 guardians have been tra trained to date, and this is the uh, celebration or their uh, graduation ceremony. So six minutes. Thank you, thank you all. Um, we're going to have a few questions after, but I, uh, I just want to thank you because it's. I know it can be tough sitting there for a long time, and there's a lot of information, but um, yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're almost there. <laughs> so can we put that on, please? Kayla Kessler, thank you very much everybody. The reason why we're assembled here tonight in this house, in the Konwatsi big house, is um, to acknowledge the accomplishment and the achievement of these graduates um, that have participated in what has come to be known as the Stewardship Technicians Training Program, a program that was delivered in partnership with Vancouver Island University and now McCullough's Council. The whole program was inspiring. It was very eye-opening. Everything that we were taught, we could take from an academic level and bring it out into the field and learn how to translate the data and just take it from a scientific point of view and relate it to our cultural and traditional views. And the technical skills that we've gotten from this program moving forward are going to help out uh, the Campbell River Indian Band in our future projects immensely. Working with uh, stewardship within my nation, I think it's going to be really good. I feel that it's going to be very useful for our, our nation to have more people out there working in the stewardship program, protecting our lands and keeping our native lands the way they should be. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here to Kwanwatsi, the House of Thunder. On behalf of the Weokum Nation, welcome everybody here to the traditional territories of the Liquido people. And I'm um, very proud of, of the, these men and women as, as the second group to graduate from this program that has been delivered on coastwide in British Columbia. Uh, so I think that speaks a lot to the fact of how different groups and regions of, of nations can come together on a common ground and a common basis of how important it is that we uphold what those sustainability principles are from our point of view and having the means to carry those out. To work as a guardian for my nation. It's based mostly around education so we can educate even those who have known much of their lives what is going on in our terrestrial water areas and then we get to teach the youth. We get to bring the youth in, teach them and inspire them to want to be environmental uh, stewards themselves. I feel that Nomakolis and VIU really plan this out to make it worthwhile for us students. I feel good that I am graduating. It's another accomplishment. I think it's important that we acknowledge those of the help. So I'd like to start with um, Pam Botterill from Vancouver Island University. It's great to be here. And, uh, we too from Vancouver Island University really want to recognize uh, our partnership with Nanakoulis. Okay, so without any further say or do, we are going to call up the grads. So we're going to start with uh, Rochelle Anton from the Comox First Nation. It's Wayne Bell, the Mamalea Club First Nation. 
Christina Brown, Comox First Nation. Corey Cliff, Weewakum First Nation. Angela Davidson, Danakta First Nation. Jordan Everson, Comox First Nation. Samuel Joey Henderson, Weewakum First Nation. Uh, Darren Puglis, the Mamalekla First Nation. Uh, Nolan Puglis, Danakta First Nation. Uh, Kenneth Robertson, Numgees First Nation. Uh, Brent Smith with the Wewakai Nation. Uh, unfortunately, not here today because he's out on the fishing grounds. So, I'd like to congratulate Brent. <laughs> Elijah Wadhams, Tawitsi's First Nation. Oh, Isaac Williams, Fatsino. Today, we've taken another significant step forward in protecting those lands and resources in a manner that the Creator placed out before us. So it's very encouraging to see institutions of the Elk of Vancouver Island University understanding that we need to solve these problems by keeping people in our communities. We need to train people in our communities so they can work in our communities and they can raise healthy families in our communities. So I really want to thank Vancouver Island University for stepping out and understanding that to keep our people home is the best medicine that we can have. So give it to us. When I walked into this class two years ago, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was going to do. The course has opened up my eyes to how our land has been abused and I'm seeing all the damage that is done and I want to make a change in the futures. So we do the stewardship for the land for ourselves and we do it for our, the future generations and we also do it for our ancestors. They took care of the land for us. Um, we do it for them out of respect. Uh, that concludes our, our evening in here. You know, round of applause and uh, hooray for the accomplishments of these graduates. So um, I want to do a shout out to Vancouver Island University, Sheila, Sharon, if you could stand and be recognized. These are our partners. <laughs> one, of, one of the things we had talked about was uh, creating a, a memorandum of understanding, another one, but we didn't, uh, we didn't do it. But I think this is a really important question that we have to ask ourselves about how do we engage and who do we bring into the room to uh, participate in this process? Because it's um, very, it's very uh, critical on how this gets shaped. We, as the indigenous place-based people, need to shape this. Nobody else. And so who do we trust to bring into the room? And uh, I think that's a part of the... Um, the questioning, and that's kind of where we're at. How are we doing for time here? Okay, how many minutes? Okay, we got 15 or 20 minutes. I do, we just framed it out a little bit here for questions, key considerations, open-ended for you to think about, mostly on, uh, I guess it would be my, my right the uh, network development and guardian training arrangements and the question of professional certification. These are the really key parts of the, the um, thinking that we need to do on how we move forward. And there are specialists in education, but we also have to have our people in the room to ensure that our, our local and traditional knowledge is incorporated into it. So I think that more or less concludes this part of the presentation, so I think we should just open it up to the floor now around, uh, around this discussion. 
And of course, you'll have the uh, luxury once we're done here to uh, go through the, the documents in detail. Thank you, Frank and Keith. And I have a hand over here. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to say um, this has been an amazing opportunity for me to, to listen to all this. But um, I'm, I'm hoping maybe Miles Richardson will talk a little bit about who shouldn't be in the room. But um, what, I, what I'd like to say is, is that we do currently have a Northern Civil Culture Committee and a Southern Civil Culture Committee. And every year they get together. I know in the Northern Civil Culture Committee this year has started a program where um, First Nations are invited to share in the information. And this is the Western knowledge part. But um, you don't have to be a professional biologist or a professional forester. We're looking to encourage more participation. In fact, this year uh, we had a couple, I think, of guardians from Babine. And, I, and if they're here, maybe they could stand up and say that they were present at the Northern Civil Culture Committee and maybe they can talk about. But we talk about moose uh, research that's been going on in terms of there's been some new revelations on um, moose diet and um, other things we deal with. Lots of things on the land that I think that is critical information sharing that we need to have with the guardians um, because we can do the research and we can know the information, but implementation and how it happens in the territories is something that needs to be spearheaded by the guardians. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Here. Uh, just before we move on, uh, just to let you know that Miles is going to speak to the question that I heard was about who shouldn't be in the room. That, that'll be brought up in the next panel for, from Miles. <laughs> Miles is the bad cop. No, I'm kidding. He isn't. Right here. Thank you for an incredible conference. This is absolutely informative and lots of um, networking and working with each other. Thank you for allowing us to be on your traditional territories to learn this. This. Um, I just wanted to ask if the training is open to other Indigenous peoples in other parts of Canada, and for how long is it? Because a lot of our territories don't have such things until we work to develop them. Wow. Uh, maybe we can ask uh, VIU to answer that, but what I do know is this, that uh, this is all proposal driven. You know, we, we raise the money to do these programs and it's uh, federal money that supports the communities and the communities, it's a partnership between the uh, First Nation and the Training Institute. And so we, that's how, how the program actually rolls out. I think that there is absolutely an opportunity to do more of this that this is an, an example. I think that you know, Vancouver Island University has its catchment area, but I'm sure there's other areas, not only in the rest of the province, but the rest of the country that th can definitely look at this. And I'm sure VIU would be open to having that conversation and, the, and they're here. So uh, I, the, the simple answer, I guess, is yes. Around uh, exploring or participating in this training. The answer is yes, and then go talk to Sheila. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, just, I just want to say... Microphone, have, so everyone can hear. Funding, so it's soft dollars that we've been able to... Sheila, can you use the mic, please? It'll be better. Because it needs to go on the recording as well. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. It, it has been soft dollars, so it's been proposal-driven proposal in, in, in partnership with the feds and the province. And of course, um, we were fortunate enough, both when, in our partnership with Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative and with Nanakola's Council, to actually get three years of funding, where we were able to put through um, three cohorts up in the north uh, central coast of BC and two on the North Island. That was huge for us. So we were constantly writing proposals, right? Uh, that was huge for us and great learning during that and uh, great partnerships among those. Uh, 
the, the current program, I can send people information about it, but it, it, we do it in 14 one-week courses and we spread that over whatever. I'm just about to go into the Gitsan territory. Uh, we're starting a program at the end of uh, March and they're, they're doing the first year in seven consecutive weeks. So it's flexible delivery, it, you know, whatever, but, but it, it's in partnerships, I'm sure, with your community colleges and uh, universities in the area, but I'm always open to have discussions. Thank you. And we have a question way over on the far side. And we have another one over here on the, this first table here. Thank you. Maxine. It's just amazing to see the amount of First Nations stewards in, in one place, what comes to my mind is the importance of nation building or nation rebuilding. I'm excited to bring this information home and talk further about Vancouver Island University and, and institutes that are willing to work with our communities. There's tons of indigenous governance that we need to move into. I'm excited to start developing a program for our community or with our community and incorporate archeology. span There's so much in our territories that haven't been unveiled. I hope we can work with the federal and provincial governments so that we could access funding, so that I don't have to focus on building proposals, because the work we do is proposal driven, and we're applying for small pockets of money. As soon as the money arrives, we're writing reports. So that's why I talk about nation rebuilding. Perhaps if we can work with the provincial and federal governments to build capacity in our communities, then we will indeed be working on true reconciliation. I'm, I've been involved in resource management for like the majority of my life but I am an Aboriginal guardian, and I've been doing this work for many years. And it's been awesome to be here these past couple of days to reconnect with those that initially started back in the 90s. I kind of laughed when I seen some of the people, and, and I said, we've come for full circle now, and we're starting again. So um, I'd like to thank the people that have organized this event. I had all these questions that you have put out in your PowerPoint. And one of my questions was, what are our next steps? Only because this has come full circle for me. And it's such, I'm so happy to see such young stewards indigenous stewards putting their best foot forward to help their communities. It's so awesome to hear that there are some people or groups connecting their youth with their elders. And I heard about the language. The priorities are our language. When we go over our place names, and I start to, if we're to translate them, one of our creeks in our community is, its English name is North Creek, but our place name and the translation for our place name is Fish Trap Creek. So though our language, the better we know our language or get to relearn our language, the more it will unveil 
the amount of valuable resources that we hold as indigenous people and our connection to our lands. I look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Frank? That's a very important question about next steps. Well, we gotta think about where we're at. You know, we've got the $25 million. We're almost halfway through. That's split between First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis. Uh, we have to make a business case. You know, they think about the uh, Australian model since 2009. $850 million gone into the community and to do this important work. So we're talking about a major shift and I think an important part of the next steps is for you, all of you, all of us, to reach out to our communities and to our neighboring communities and to leadership. Our leadership and uh, the federal leadership and our, our connections to say that there needs to be a serious investment into supporting Indigenous guardians. When we leave this place, we can't just take our folder and our, our jump drives and throw it into our, our uh, filing cabinet. We got to take action because if we're going to properly resource these programs to do the work of stewarding our lands and waters, then, then we got to make the case. You know, the ILI has provided the vision and the leadership for us. The Joint Working Group has been working with our partners, but ultimately it's up to the communities, it's up to you, it's up to us to move it forward and uh, implement it because we're giving them a solution as indigenous people, we're providing a solution to so many challenging issues that they have. Thank you, Frank. Um, where's my other microphone holder? I have the, el yes, I'll get to it just a moment. We have the elder here, and then we have one over here. I don't know how many mics are out there. So let's go, I have a question here, and then we'll go to the elder. Hello, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? There we go. Uh, my name is Steve Dennis of Ahousit, here on behalf of Moctisi Sahothi Stewardship Society. Uh, at the moment, there's a lot of questions running through my head. Too many to answer, too many to ask, but I'm glad that uh, I have family that I can call upon and get answers daily from. I saw this opportunity as a time to give thanks to everybody for taking the steps um, on behalf of the new Guardian programs that are going across the nation here. I'm uh, 26 years old, uh, one year into the Guardian program, and it's everything that I could have imagined. It's an opportunity that has been given um, because of the steps that everybody in this room has made. So I just want to give thanks and say, Kleko, Kleko, on behalf of a house that choo. Thank you. Alder? Merci beaucoup pour le, le micro. C'est C'est la, la première fois où je peux trouver euh, une table où c'est que je peux aller chercher l'information parce que dans, dans le nord où c'est qu'on était, c'était sur le territoire euh, de, mes, de mon mari et aussi ça comprenait sur, sur le territoire euh, de Terre-Neuve et du Québec et avec la convention de la Bédjens, il y a eu beaucoup de l'occupation avec euh, les cris de Nascapi. Et aujourd'hui, euh, on est en, pris entre les trois frontières. Et dans nos vies, il n'y avait jamais eu de frontière avec mes grands-parents. Mais il faut vivre 
avec les trois, les trois euh, considérations d'aujourd'hui et je suis contente que je vais pouvoir avoir euh, des réponses euh, très positives de vivre ensemble avec ce, la madame qui était ici concernant les mines. Et peut-être que je vais pouvoir partir en paix pour laisser mes enfants dans une nouvelle vie, euh, partager la terre ensemble. Et aussi à la question des mines, euh, que tout euh, le chemin des, des aînés qui sont pris avec euh, le train, beaucoup de pollution qui se fait, pollution aussi avec, avec l'air, avec les mines. Et je, c'est la première fois que je trouve une, une, une table pour pouvoir sortir de mon négatif avec le, la vie que je mène avec les trois, les trois difficultés. Et aussi, je voudrais laisser un bon message aux gardiens. Chez les aînés, les autres, euh, ils disent que les petits caribous, quand ils naissent, il faut qu'ils marche sur la neige pour leur donner la force pour vivre, pour pouvoir poursuivre le, le chemin avec euh, la migration. Et les gardiens aussi, il faut qu'ils marchent sur le territoire pour faire une nation forte. C'est ça que je laisse aux gardiens, j'en suis très fière. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. I will translate for Frank and the others in the room. So, um, Ene uh, André said that she was very happy for um, becoming, well, coming here. She found a venue uh, where she will have like positive outcomes coming out of this conference and this gathering. Um, she was telling us that she is from an area where Um, before there were no boundaries between communities, but with development, uh, there are now three boundaries and the communities are cut off from uh, one to each other. And she is happy that the guardians will help with breaking those boundaries and maybe be able to work um, and be together again as a nation and between communities. And she made an analogy um, for the uh, guardians Um, they're like the baby caribous. Um, apparently when they grow up, they have to walk on the snow to become stronger. And she said the guardians have to be like the baby caribous. They have to walk on the snow to become stronger and then become the, the, the beautiful animal that we know caribous are. And uh, she wanted also to thank people for the gathering because she felt that She will leave this place with a more positive uh, view and then she can leave behind the negative um, aspect of her life. And uh, she's hopeful that when she leaves the earth, her children and her grandkids will have a beautiful uh, territory. Thank you, Alder. Uh, our next one is over on this side. Uh, hello. Um, from a coordinator position, I'm just wondering, I guess, from when you uh, reached out to VIU, and maybe this is a question for VIU as well, um, when the community reached out to VIU for training, um, how long was that relationship? Like, how long did it take to establish the training program? Um, and then um, how long did it take to work out the kinks? Yeah, we can both respond. I think that's oh. good, a good way of doing it. Um, we'll start with Frank, and could we get a microphone down over on this table, please? So uh, I actually, um, when I left my own community and went and worked regionally, I took that relationship with VIU with me. I mean, uh, we did a protocol with my nation and then we uh, set something up with, the, uh, with VIU to work for coastal First Nations and we did the pilot. So it, it evolved, you know, there, um, 
They also helped us with doing an events management training program when we hosted tribal journeys in our community of Bella Bella. And so, you know how things go sometimes, they were just, evo it evolved and, uh, you know, sometimes it was frustrating and it wasn't exactly what we wanted, but, you know, it requires discipline and uh, we didn't throw the baby out with the bath water when things didn't work out exactly with the way we, we uh, wanted to happen in it. And I, I really want to be sure not to mischaracterize this. It's, um, even though it could be this, the tribal council and this institution, the truth of it is, it's people, champions like Sheila and Sharon and Frank and Kathy and, and in the institution, in the academy and these uh, indigenous champions in the village, in the community. That's who actually makes this work. When we come to forums like this, we make it all formal, but it's people. And so it, it's just meandered over time and it's, it's proved itself and it's been a good investment of time. And I don't think we're there yet. I think we need to, it's gonna evolve some more and uh, we're gonna bring SFU uh, in to help at that strategic level, because that's what they do. And that's what we were doing, was thinking very, you know, I wanted to cultivate relationships with groups. And when I was the stewardship director with a, uh, a resource and environmental management faculty, like at one point I had 30, masters and PhD candidates working for us. And I was quarterbacking that and basically saying, how does this inform our thinking about our responsibility for stewardship? And if it didn't, and somebody came with a research question, I'd say, I'm sorry, but we just don't have time for that. But if it, if it has an application to the research question to inform our responsibility for stewardship, then we're definitely prepared to have that conversation. And the director of the time said to me, it's like a gift to somebody working on a master or a PhD degree if you can help them with that research question. And they get the question and they can go deep into that question. So it's a reciprocal relationship. I think that's also really important that our relationships have to be reciprocal, like uh, where it's, it's not extractive to us as indigenous communities because it feels like sometimes, you know, research come in and start mining our intellectual property and our process. And you can almost, every one of our communities count on one hand who's doing all the work, right? Am I wrong? You know, so, so though those people we have to really take care of because they're the ones that are working so hard and we don't, and our elders, we don't want, researchers coming in and asking the same question over and over and over again. So that's from our perspective. Sheila, you got something to add on that? Uh, the, only, the only thing I would add is, um, in our partnership with Coastal First Nations, where Frank started us off, I then was working with Claire Hutton. And what she had done in a, an amazing job of, as she was working as a training coordinator for Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative at the time, had done an amazing job of facilitating with the stewardship directors and probably some of the guardians I was participating, a training needs analysis that was the base of what we could, and I work very closely with Claire, um, what we could then take to faculty, to whatever, what do we have, where are the gaps, where, what, what do we do here? And we started with sort of a six course program and then very quickly moved it up and bumped it up to the existing 15, 14. But as Frank says, it's evolving and changing all the time. Thank you. Over on this side. Good afternoon. Thank you. It's been a wonderful couple of days. I, I'm really inspired. Um, I took the Aboriginal Fishery Guardian training in the 90s. And it, it seemed really huge at the time. They, they had all these big plans. But it, it seemed to have just slowly disappeared. So I'm wondering if, since we're all looking for long-term funding, if that AFS, Aboriginal Fishery Guardian Fund, has been accessed to support this program. Because it seems to have just stayed stagnant for the past 10 years. Thank you. Frank? Yeah, I seen Jordan point in the room. Are you still in here, Jordan? So um, that's a very good question. And uh, 
you know, let, let that be a cautionary comment to all of us that this could, uh, if we're not careful and we're not diligent and we don't keep the pressure on that, uh, that we, we could uh, be in jeopardy of ending up in a similar circumstance where we don't get resources and to continue it, to advance this. That's, that's one comment that I have. Um, I see Jordan's in the room. There was a question, Jordan, about the, um, the Fisheries Garden, Guardian program and accessing dollars and the relationship between this program. I hope I'm characterizing it accurately. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I seen you were in the room, so I'm just um, kind of putting you on a spot a bit, but uh, the, it can Yes, uh, she wanted question? to know, I think the question was um, this guardianship program, she was part of it in the early 90s. Uh, we're looking for stable funding and wondered about the AFS and whether or not that had been or could be accessed and Frank is deferring to you. Um, Jordan Point is the um, executive director for the First Nations Fisheries Council First in BC. Co Fisheries Council, British Columbia, yeah. So uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the full scope of the question, but in terms of where the DFO AFS Guardian Program is concerned, all of the programs are currently under review. Uh, they're under a national review. So that was the ARAM Program, the PICTI Program, and the AFS Program. And the Guardian program from DFO stems from the Aboriginal Fishery Strategy program. So that program is under review, and uh, the National Fisheries Institute, the Indigenous Fisheries Institute, has been doing this review for about a year on the whole Guardian program. Uh, we just concluded uh, last week meeting um, uh, for the review itself, and the final report will be coming out with recommendations probably next month. Um, so the, the, the short answer to the question about funding and resourcing, um, the Guardian program support for um, guardians is essentially withered on the vine. There is no real funding to support that. Um, most people see the AFS program as a subsidy and they're having to be creative to fund their Guardian programs. So um, what we're doing is, is really identifying what we heard, to, I mean, we had meetings all across Canada in reviewing the Guardian program and recognizing that uh, as part of the recommendations, of course, we want to be developing clear standards. I've heard a lot of common language in the recommendations here uh, uh, that Frank was just speaking to. Um, but in terms of funding, of course, uh, that's part of the recommendations that will be coming out with uh, the Indigenous Fisheries Report. So. Like I said, I, I was just running out to go put another loony in the meter and somebody came and grabbed me, so I didn't hear the scope of the question, but I hope I answered some of it. Thank you. Essentially, no. I think, um, I think Miles would like to have an add-on. Jordan, yeah, hopefully, because Jordan and I agree on this. It doesn't sound like it, but we do. I was in, there's an important, that question brings forward a really important lesson for us to learn in moving forward on this Guardians initiative, this Guardians network. And in, in the mid 90s, the Sparrow decision came out and the Supreme Court of Canada recognized the Aboriginal right to fish. It was a priority over any other fisheries in the law. So we had to turn that into um, policy and regulation. So we, through the Aboriginal Fisheries Strategy, we set up a, a government to government fisheries regime that the lingo there was government to government. It, it meant the same thing as we mean today by nation to nation. Our nations in British Columbia and across the country pulled together and supported that principle. We set up a program that was truly government to government. The federal government sent in a negotiating team. They set it up procedurally the way we asked for it as First Nations. I know that because I was the chief negotiator in BC. 
on, as a summit executive member. And I remember the minister of the day saying, ah, I agree with government to government. You organize yourselves the way you want. If you want to call yourself nations, that's your business. But that worked for us for that time, for that period. And they set up money that flew through our collective le levels that came down. And you know, we were talking in those days. One of the elements of that initiative was guardians, fisheries guardians. And we were talking those days of authorizing indigenous fisheries guardians at the same level as RCMP. We were talking about training them and um, authorizing them to that level. And then the federal government lost patience. I think a new government came in. They had a different policy. They started saying, you may want a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, but we make the laws here in Ottawa. And, every, and our people accepted it. And today, the, uh, the Fisheries Guardian Initiative, the Aboriginal Fisheries Program, such as it is, is simply a government program. Jordan agrees with nation-to-nation. -nation. Right now, we haven't moved on that. We have... And on, go on going forward, I'm going to talk about this a little bit. The only thing that's going to maintain a nation-to-nation -nation program is our will. Our relations with each other as nations and our will to be treated as that. If we let it go, we're, you know, our, our successors are going to be meeting 20 years from now and saying, didn't we learn from the fisheries experience? We got it right in front of us now, and it's totally up to us. I think that's a great question, and we best learn from it. This is doable. Thank you. And our last question back here. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to everyone here um, and to the Coast Salish for hosting this event. But first and foremost, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Tlaloquit First Nation for allowing me to uh, work with them and come uh, attend this event uh, on their behalf. Uh, I just wanted to speak up because I heard a lot of voices talking about uh, concern about how to fund your respective guardian programs and um, I wanted to encourage you all to uh, consider approaching your local non-indigenous populations in the places where you live because uh, I was encouraged by seeing the premier here today, uh, yesterday but I also know that some of the, the government that he represents and some of the things that has happened while he's been in power have not been in everyone's interest. But I think there are a lot of non-Indigenous people in your communities that um, understand and respect the work that you do and would be eager to participate. Um, that's how I ended up with the, working with Tlaoquit because I could see that they are doing a better job taking care of their land than the non-Indigenous government was. Um, and the work that I'm doing with them, we've created a certification program. It's called the Tribal Parks Allies. And it's a way to try to engage the non-Indigenous uh, business community, the vibrant tourism economy that exists because of the environmental stand that the nation took in the 90s. And uh, it's just in its nascent phase, just started in November, but uh, I just wanted to bring that up because it's been, it's successful in its early stages. I'm hopeful that I can come here next year and report some, you know, success stories. We're hoping that the business community locally is going to uh, support the Guardian program and pay their wages year to year, support cultural resurgence initiatives. And uh, I think that if it's within your capacities, it'd be good, it'd be in your interests for your communities and your organizations to try to reach out to the locals as well because reconciliation I believe is something that will be led at the local level not at the national or provincial level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a gent in the far corner. He will be the last. You're standing between your colleagues and break. I'm just letting you know.
So if we could get a microphone over in that corner. Miigwech. Kwaachi Minawa. Simak Sibigan and Wagdoji. John Katvich and Kas. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, John Katvi, and I'm from Kishnek Sabininwak. It's a community in northwestern Ontario. And uh, nothing like talking under pressure. I'll try not to keep you very long. But I was reading the uh, terms of reference, and I was looking at the purpose of this, and it was called the Indigenous Leadership Initiative for the Guardians Program. And I was looking at uh, how the budget was divided up, and I noticed that, uh, mind you, I'm not very good with numbers. I, I, still, uh, I still get uh, three every time uh, I add one. Um, but in there, I noticed that uh, 2.8 million remains with the Government of Canada for administration. And we're talking about uh, looking for funding, sustainable funding, uh, to enable our programming uh, on uh, monitoring what happens on our lands. And um, then now we have 2.8 million being set aside for administration, as if that we cannot um, be trusted to look after our own land, which we've been doing for thousands and thousands of years. So my question is, uh, why are we, if we're so strapped for funding, why are we allowing that 2.8 million to be clawed back uh, when it was uh, designated for uh, Guardian programs? Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you. Frank? Well, I don't know. I think you've got to give yourself more credit. You caught that there. That's a very good question and a very important question, and you have every right to ask that question. Because in my opinion, these dollars are targeted dollars. There is a high level political kit commitment on the Government of Canada with the Indigenous Leadership Initiative when they met and lobbied for this money. Not only didn't they uh, get the $500 million that they were asking for, they got $25 million to do a pilot. Just about $3 million is being retained by Canada for a secretariat. And that's just the truth of it. That's you know, Canada's secretariat. That's, that's right. That's Canada's secretariat. And, and that's been problematic. You know, I was, uh, I was pretty offended when I first realized what happened. But um, there's been a commitment to try to raise additional funds because it's inequitable to us, not to have our own resources to be at the table. Thank goodness for the ILI that's been able to, uh, you know, bring us together in some respects. So this is problematic and uh, we'll definitely keep that in mind as we pursue the $500 million that we're not going to allow this to happen again, because that's not good faith. They got an operating budget and, uh, you know, our people need resources to do the work. And that doesn't sit well with uh, the indigenous part of the joint working group, but there is nothing we could do about it. We didn't know. And I'm not apologizing. That's just a fact of the matter. But... Uh, Personally, I'm not one to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're going to keep trying to make this work just like our people always have for the, our higher interest. But we expect some reciprocity in that process. Actually, I'm trying to be diplomatic. I was pissed right off when I read it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have a... Are we thinking? Thank you. No, I was wondering. I'd like to thank, let's have a round of applause for the panel. Yes. 
And we do have a gift for Keith to say thank you. Yes, that was a good question to end on. You are officially on break. We're coming back in 15. Thank you.